Hello. It is now 5.30, and we're going to begin our third meeting of the Special Task Force here at San Jose State University. I welcome everyone, and I thank our task force members for your participation. I thank those of you who are here to observe the meeting and those who are listening and or watching from off-site. And finally, a big thank you to the panelists for being here to assist us today. Um, Today we take up the subjects of residential living and frosh orientation at the university. Uh, before doing so, uh, I'd like every one of our task members to please uh, introduce yourselves. Just again, say your name and your affiliation, if you will. And we'll start on this side this time. Good evening. Tony Ross, Vice President of Student Affairs, California State University, Los Angeles. Uh, Gabriel Rodriguez, Director of Intercultural Affairs for Associated Students. Hi, El oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Lynn, Director of Counseling Services. Delorme McKeesteval, alumni and the Director of the Office of Human Relations. <laughs> My name is Gary Daniels and I'm a concerned student. And I'm Linda Hyden, Chair of the Academic Senate and a concerned faculty member. Hi, Willie Hagan, President of Cal State Dominguez Hills. Could you try it again so it gets picking up? Hi, Willie Hagan, President of Cal State Dominguez Hills. I'm Judge Cordell, and I'm the Chair of the Task Force. I'm Rick Callender. I'm Vice President of the California Hawaii NAACP. Could you turn the mic up, please, for him? So do it again, Rick. Excuse me. Good evening, I'm Rick Callender. I'm Vice President of the California Hawaii NAACP. And I'm Marcos Pizarro, I'm Chair of Mexican American Studies. Bernadette Shane. No, nope. turn the mic up please. Hello, yeah. Bernadette Shane, former CSU faculty trustee and Professor Emerita Humboldt State University. Maria Luisa Lanes, faculty, sociology and interdisciplinary could you, could social you say science. It again, the whole thing, it didn't pick up in the beginning. Maria Luisa Lanis, Faculty, Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Science. My name is Michael Randall. I'm an advisor for Academic Advising and Retention Services. I'm Chris Cox. I'm a lecturer of faculty in the Department of Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Sciences. Hi, my name is Diana Zen. I'm a nursing student on campus. I'm Gabby Gonzalez. I'm a Justice Studies student. And I am Peter Lee, a third year student and vice president of Associated Students. All right, today we take up the subjects of residential living and frosh orientation. And our purpose is to learn as much as we can about these programs so that our subsequent recommendations are informed and doable. Uh, to this end, the task force members were invited to submit questions uh, in advance of this meeting. And the questions that we have received were then forwarded to staff so they could be prepared to address them and answer them tonight. Three task force members did submit questions in advance. That was Delorme, thank you so much. Rick Callender, thank you. And Dr. Lynn, right there, thank you. Uh, after our panelists introduce themselves, I'll ask them to begin by answering these questions that have been given to you all. And thereafter, task force members can ask follow-up questions or additional questions. Um, please bear in mind, uh, task force members, that we are not investigators, we are not fact finders. That work has been done. We are gatherers of information. At our meetings, we do not point fingers, we do not assign blame. I especially want the staff who are here to speak to us today to understand this. You have nothing to fear. We are all here with the same goals to make recommendations that will improve the campus climate and that will put in place procedures and policies to ensure that incidents like the racial bullying incident will not reoccur. And if such incidents do reoccur, to ensure that there's swift and appropriate response by the administration. So let us begin by having each of the panelists introduce her or himself. Tell us how long you've been employed by the university, your title, your primary responsibilities, and to whom you report. And then we will then have the appropriate person or persons answer questions that have been submitted to you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Kelly. Uh, I've been at the university for eight years and I am the director of student involvement. Uh, I report to Kathy Busalaki, who is the associate vice president for campus life. Um, my day-to-day, -day, or my primary responsibility, student involvement oversees uh, the student organization community at San Jose State, which includes uh, all of the 44 fraternities and sororities, uh, leadership programming, uh, as well as um, advising of uh, associated students, and then the frosh orientation and other transition programs. Okay, thank you. Hello. My name is Emily Bauer. I've been at San Jose State for almost seven years. I'm the Associate Director for Student Involvement. So for me, I'm the team lead for the Student Success Team. We cover frosh orientation, fall welcome days, leadership programs, and some success initiatives. And I report to Richard Kelly. I'm sorry, you report to whom? Richard Kelly. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephanie Hubbard. I've been employed at San Jose State for eight years. Uh, I am, though, a uh, very proud alum of San Jose State. Uh, my job title is Associate Director for Residential Life. My primary responsibilities are to oversee the entire residential life program, which includes all aspects of residential living from the day students check in until the day they check out. Uh, that includes judicial uh, programming, um, educational development, uh, all the administrative aspects, um, mediation, uh, training, education, uh, and all other aspects. Uh, I report to uh, Vic Collada, Victor Collada. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Victor Collada. I have worked at the university for nearly five years. My job title is Director, University Housing Services. My primary responsibilities, which also goes to a little bit about our organization, University Housing houses currently 3,722 residents. And my responsibilities are to manage a comprehensive housing and residential life program. And the four major components to my operation include residential life, facilities planning, operations, and also finance. So those are the four major categories for housing and residential life. We are a 365 day year operation and we do operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And I report also to Kathy Busalaki, the Associate Vice President for Campus Life. All right, thank you all. Uh, thank you again for, for coming here, for giving us your time, particularly after hours. Uh, we're going to start by uh, addressing or at your answering the questions that have been sent out. And I, I'm assuming everybody here at the task force got a one sheet, two-sided, which now has all of the questions that have been submitted in advance. And they've been sorted out by categories. So we have residential housing questions, student orientation questions, and housing staff questions, and then there's housing. So, um, and I think these have been separated out by questioners, not necessarily by, by subject matter. So um, how do you, panelists, how would you like to proceed with these? Do you wanna just take them as they are appear on the sheets? Okay. For the housing and residential life questions, what we noticed were that there were similarly grouped questions that yes. naturally fell together from sure. each of the so task force members. And, sure. and so what we did was we grouped them together um, so that it would kind of flow. And um, I'd like to begin by Go responding right to the first question, which was, what is the mission statement of university housing? And um, just um, so that you all know, you will be receiving uh, quite a number of handouts um, after our presentation. And so much of what we are sharing is going to be also included in the handouts that we provide, as well as some reference to other places where you can find additional materials if you'd like those. Um, the U University Housing Services mission statement reads as follows. University Housing Services strives to create a residential community that supports and enhances academic success, 
fosters the learning and development of our students, and promotes student involvement and civic engagement. As a department, our practices promote efficiency, operational effectiveness, and fiscal responsibility. As an integral member of the San Jose State University community and Division of Student Affairs, we value accountability, communication, community, education, integrity, value, and we also consider ourselves to be visionaries. You also asked what the <clears throat> You also asked what the annual objectives and goals were for the residential life program um, that guide our work. Uh, our residential life vision is, uh, as stated, uh, as, a vi as a part of a vibrant and growing housing program, residential life strives to be intentional and student-centered. We work collaboratively with members of the SGSU community to provide the following vision, or to promote the following vision. We help our students build inclusive, socially just, and interactive communities where every member feels a sense of belonging. We work to foster student growth in a manner that shapes character and develops independence. We encourage our students to explore their ide personal identity and embrace diversity as well as appreciate individuality. We promote healthy communication, intellectual discourse, and support students in achieving academic success. We endeavor to help our students understand their role, rights, and responsibilities as a member of the SGSU committee, community and as citizens of our world. In that, we have three primary goals. The first is to develop a strong residential life staff team. The second is, to, is that students will benefit from living on campus and want to return to housing. And the third is that we serve as, a, we serve as useful academic support for our students. Uh, in the packet that you'll be receiving, there is also an org chart um, for both UHS and um, housing. You wanna? Um, that's all right. Um, and so just so you know, uh, there is a full UHS one, and then there is another one for residential life because we're a little bit more complex, and uh, we have a large number of staff. Um, behind that document is actually an overview of who's who. That seemed to be something that was unclear in the questions. So there's an outline of who the staff are that work in housing. Uh, the people who live in our buildings and work with our students on a daily basis. There is the residential life coordinator. That is a professional staff member who typically has master's level degree in student development or a related field. They work full time, live in the buildings, and are responsible for the overall general supervision and management of the entire residential community. Uh, they're responsible for the advisement and personal counseling of individuals and groups of students. They are also responsible for policy enforcement and for the implementation of residential programs which support the goals of the housing program and university. What's the person's title again? What is the, the Residential Life Coordinator, also known as the RLC. We love acronyms in housing. I'll try not to use them, but the RLC. Uh, there are also assistant residential life coordinators. These are graduate students who are getting their uh, graduate de degree, some in the area of student development, uh, leadership and education, others in fields such as, um, um, sorry, uh, multicultural areas of uh, interest, uh, city and planning of design, counseling, uh, and so forth. These folks work part-time, they live in the residence halls, and they work to support the RLC in the overall supervision of the building. Uh, they also have a collateral assignment, uh, which could be working with our student review board, uh, overseeing our, our desks in all of our buildings, or advising our whole government. Then as we get to our other students, we have our resident advisors, our theme community RAs, and our senior resident advisors. I'll talk about the senior RAs first. The senior resident advisors are returning RAs who have been hired to be senior resident advisors. Their primary responsibility is to be an RA. In addition to that, they're responsible for overseeing, managing, and supervising a front uh, courtesy desk in, in the building anywhere from one to three desks, depending on the configuration of the area that they live in. The 
<clears throat> they also work with the RLC and the ARLC, which is the professional and grad staff uh, who supervise the bu building or area uh, in order to provide leadership and insight uh, and feedback about the student uh, resident advisor experience. We have theme community RAs, uh, which are, we have four different, I'm sorry, five different theme communities, which I'll, um, which are listed, uh, I believe, in um, the uh, findings um, from uh, Mr. Mike Moy. Uh, and so uh, these theme community RAs are also RAs who have additional responsibilities to provide programming, additional programming and content uh, in the guise of the theme, uh, well, the theme, which would either be business, uh, engineering, uh, arts, uh, global uh, village, which is a multicultural and international program, uh, as well as um, our uh, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, intersex, uh, and ally program um, in one of our residence halls. Uh, so these folks, again, do additional programming. I know that you've talked about their position before um, and uh, have additional responsibilities in that respect but also fulfill all responsibilities of the RA. And then, of course, we have the RA. Uh, the RA is responsible for, um, they are a student staff member. Uh, they live within the residential community. Uh, they work to effectively maintain and further enhance the housing program. Uh, RAs can help with roommate and community uh, mate difficulties. So they do room mediations. They help to ensure that students complete the roommate agreements. Uh, they're selected um, for particular interests um, and values that they are able to do, also that they have the um, maturity and the skill set to be an RA, uh, because it's a very challenging and difficult position. Uh, they have um, responsibility for doing rounds in the building, which means they walk the floors um, two to three times a night while on duty to ensure that policies are being upheld, uh, that quiet hours are maintained, and when they find that people are not in compliance with policies, then they are responsible for documenting those incidents, notifying those residents, and or engaging and helping to cease such behavior. Um, they do that uh, through a variety of ways, and that could involve calling the ARLC, the Assistant Residential Life Coordinator, to come and provide support, or the RLC, if it is a, a more in-depth incident, and also uh, often they call UPD, uh, University Police Department, to assist them. C can you tell us why there's no RAs on the panel today? N either senior, assistant, or just RAs? Right. Yeah. Um, this has been um, a challenging year, um, and I think that uh, the year has been very impactful with our staff, um, and therefore we were not able to bring someone here today um, but, but what does that mean? In order to be respectful mean? of their time and with where people are at. No, I mean, I'm, what does that mean? That they were unwilling? You couldn't find anyone who we would We did request come? for people. We um, <coughs> talked with some people about it. Um, and however, we decided based on um, the circumstance and feedback from staff that we would not be able to bring someone here today. I guess we maybe have more discussion about that in a little bit because I'm not sure that I understand what, RAs were, but they were. I mean, that's, I'm not p trying to put yeah. you on the spot at all. I, I'm just trying to understand because I do know at at least one prior meeting here there was an RA. He was African American who came up and talked to me and said he absolutely wanted to, you know, had something to say. And that's why I'm, I'm just curious about it. But I, I don't want to take your time up on those that questions, and we'll we'll talk about that a little later. Is okay. Agree? Uh, sure, and by the way, if, if there's quick follow-ups on some of these, that's fine, but I want them to get through because we, we, gotta, we have a you lot of stuff to talk about. You a lot of questions. About. I know. <laughs> we have a lot to cover. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask for the, are, are all three RA categories, they all live in the dorms? Yes, so every, all the student RA positions, so every title that has an RA in it is oh, responsible sure. for all of the RA responsibilities, and then with additional <laughs> acronym, acronym letters come responsibility. Got it. Thank you. I just wanted to make a quick comment that I found it interesting that there are no theme communities for ethnic minorities, but there's a theme community for art 
and there's a theme community for global students, even though we have an entire I house dedicated for international students. I just want to say I found that interesting. Okay, but here's what we're going to do. We're not going to have comments on the stuff. We can do that at the end. So, you know, and, and that's important, but I want them to get their information out. If you have quick follow-up questions, that's fine. But if there's just comments on it, let's just take care of that when we're finished. Go right ahead. Thank you. And thank you, Gary. And um, maybe in order to give you a sense of the categories that we broke them down in, we just finished category number one, mm -hmm. and we have 12. So okay. just to give you a sense of where right. we are with regard to our presentation, and we'd like to move forward. Okay. Um, Excuse me one second. second. Excuse me one second, Maria. Can you give us a, a label for each of the categories? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Maria. The next category is room placement procedures. The questions were, describe the placement procedures for students applying for on-campus housing. Is it random, reviewed? How are housing placement determined? Is there a student questionnaire about preferences and needs? What questions, if any, are asked in advance of placement about gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, nationality, primary languages spoken, religion, disabilities, experience in being away from home, experiences with other cultures, receipt of diversity training in high school or at another college or university. And um, also, does the housing placement allow for potential residents to exclude and include the types of roommates they desire? So, um, simply put, um, our two main factors and questions that we ask are gender and also if a student needs a special accommodation. And if so, we do work with our office, thank you, um, our, um, our office EAC in order to accommodate those special needs that some students may have. And we are able to work with professional staff in that office in order to um, provide for those accommodations. And then also gender is important. Um, because although we have co-educational residence halls, we don't have co-ed rooms. And so those are the two things. Otherwise, the placement is random. And there is, however, two weeks into the semester, a formalized room change process where people can um, change rooms. There was also a question, too, about um, whether or not we have a questionnaire. And I will say that for the most part, brand new students, we often find that their parents are working with them to fill out the questionnaires. And way back when, I'll give you an example of something that doesn't exist anymore because all of our buildings are now non-smoking. There used to be a question, for example, do you smoke? And sometimes when mom and dad are working with their, their student, sometimes that answer might not be altogether 100% accurate. And um, that would create some interesting opportunities for us when people were assigned housing based upon their smoking preference. So I just wanted to give you an example of the reason why there's not a lot of validity put into those um, questionnaires that are sent out in advance. The other part of placement goes to the returning resident process. Those students who are currently living with us are able to actually select their roommate for the upcoming year. So if they want to um, just live with one person in a more, um, a, like in a double room, they can pick their roommate. If they want to live in an apartment, they can actually select all of their apartment mates too. So we do allow for that opportunity. So that was the uh, question dealing with uh, placement of rooms and room assignments. Quick question, uh, the incident had, there was a suite. Are suites only in theme dorms or suites can be in dorms that don't have themes? Is that just? Well, our uh, suite building is Campus Village C, and that is Campus Village C. Campus Village is comprised of three buildings, the A building, the B building, and the C building. The A and B buildings are apartments, and the C building is suites. And then we also have what we call our classic or traditional residence halls, which include the Bricks, Royce, Hoover, and Washburn Hall, and also Joe West Hall, which is our high-rise traditional residence hall. Thank you. Sure. Okay, okay. so uh, the next question uh, focused around uh, the 
well, you called it diversity training for residents. We call it programming. Uh, and so uh, one of the handouts that you will be receiving later is a copy of our programming model um, that we have created uh, in order to um, train our staff on areas that we felt are important to educate students about. Um, in our uh, um, programming model, there are six core areas, multicultural competence, values and identity, communication, academic development, lifelong learning, and civic engagement. Uh, these we feel are the six most important areas that we need to have our students uh, provide presentations, education, um, and what we call programs within the residence halls. We partner, we always plan these on their own. They will bring in outside speakers, they will present themselves, they will also collaborate with campus partners uh, as well as student organizations. <clears throat> um, the uh, programming model is based um, in, in grounded in student theory, student development theory and research. It's based on CAS standards as well as infused into it is the SJSU general education requirements. So it is very well grounded in theory um, and academic um, rigor, so to speak. Uh, and each of those tie in to those main areas. Uh, I'm not gonna read all the questions because I don't wanna take the time. I wanna be able to give you answers. Um, to let you know, uh, with those six areas, um, as I read them, obviously there are areas that um, diversity uh, and or social justice can be impacted in each of them. While we do have one category called multicultural competence, obviously values and identity can tie into that as can all of the others. Um, we believe that diversity uh, is at the core of everything that we do. Every time, every interaction that you do, diversity plays a role and it needs to be at the base and the foundation of where you act from and the center. And that's the first thing you think about and then you move on from there. Uh, that being said, uh, we did pull the number of multicultural programs that we've had just in the fall semester. We had 44 of them um, in the areas of the Big Eight. So if you don't know what the Big Eight are, um, they are um, the areas of race and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, spirituality, which of course includes religion, ability, age, class, and size. Those are the big eight. We, of course, do expand beyond that, but those are the main ones that we feel important to make sure we're educating about. I have a question. So I'm sorry, Gary. Go right ahead. Sorry, I, I missed you. No, sorry. Go ahead. So you said there were 44 total. How many in particular for race and ethnicity? Uh, I don't have that specific breakdown. Um, right now, but I can say that since it's multicultural, um, typically those tend to be ones that are more focused on race, so I would say probably at least 30% are on uh, race and ethnicity. Okay. And a, a quick follow-up on that as well. In terms of the, and I understood the eight underneath the multicultural competence breakdown, does that teach about identifying traditional symbols of hatred I'll get to that when I talk about training. Okay, this was just you. the okay. programming piece. Sure. Okay. Keep okay. Moving. Yep. moving on. So uh, the next one I wanted to talk about was the job um, responsibilities. I did talk about that a little bit. I did want to clarify um, that, so I've gone over the different positions, the RLC, which is the professional staff, the ARLC, which is the graduate staff, which works to support um, and provide limited supervision to our RAs, and then our RAs, who again are in those three categories. SRA, TCRA, RA. Um, those, uh, the RLC and the uh, RA with SRA and TCRA, those are located right here in the binder that you received. Um, and that uh, can be found in um, Exhibit H. Did you say H? H, as in Hubbard. Uh, alrighty. Um, uh, so um, I wanted to talk about the requirements. Those are listed there. One of the requirements that it states is that students are required to have one year of living experience in a community. I typically that's in the residence halls. However, if someone has been in a Greek living experience, uh, we count that as well. Um, so all of our students are typically sophomores or older. 
Um, and also our, typically we have about 40% to 50% of staff who return to the position. Uh, so they are at usually a junior or greater. For the RA to resident ratio, um, our ratio for first year students is one to 51. Uh, the national average is one to 50. The ARLC to RA ratio uh, is one to seven, but you didn't ask, but I'm going to give you the uh, RLC, which is again the main supervisor to RA ratio, which is about one to 13. Because our building areas vary from 600 for one RLC to, uh, fifth, oh, I'm sorry, uh, 1,750 for two RLCs who share that area, it does vary a little bit, but overall that is the average. So just so I'm clear on all these acronyms, so sure. the one to 51 it was for what? First year students. To? To RA, to the RA. RA to student. All right, one to seven? The one to seven was for the ARLC, which is the grad student. ALRC. Mm -hmm. And then the RLC was one to 13, RLC to RA. To RA. Mm -hmm. So the one to seven, ALRC, was, that was to student? To RA. To RA. Yeah, it's Got about it. a 350 right. student ratio, and the RLC is about a 700 Got plus it. ratio, 750. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, so uh, if you look in Exhibit H, uh, you will see that um, it talks about the overall qualifications of the RA, um, which I talked about, but it also lists the basic functions of the RA position. Uh, so the main, merely the main function is to develop community, and that means a lot of different things. Um, we really put a large focus on developing inclusive communities. Uh, communities where people feel that they are part of, that this is home, that this is where um, they can grow and develop in order to achieve academically as well as um, grow personally and individually. Uh, I know that there is much learning that happens outside of the classroom and we take that very seriously and really understand the educational, uh, edu the education that we provide for students. All of us learn to walk, talk and eat probably outside of a classroom just thinking, um, and that has the same thing that happens for our students as they leave home and they kind of um, go from their cocoon and be turned into the wonderful butterfly that they will become. So, um, so that community development means enforcing quiet hours, policy, uh, enforcement, programming, uh, ensuring that we have good relations um, with our students, that roommates are talking with one another, that uh, there are not roommate disputes, and if so, they're working to mediate those. They, administra they have administrative responsibilities. That means they're responsible for making sure that people fill out forms to check in, check out. They work a desk, they provide lockouts, they, do, uh, they fill out programming forms, they have a database they need to go in, they do evaluations, they do assessment of those programs to see if they've met the goals and learning outcomes. All of our programs have learning outcomes attached to them, um, because again, uh, it is educationally based, our, edu our programming model. Uh, and then of course there are other duties as assigned, which is always the best part of anyone's job, um, which includes things like uh, recruiting for first year students at Admitted Spartan Day when we'll have 10,000 students come to campus and share what that experience is like, um, and other types of, of functions, or when there is a crisis like a fire or a flood which unfortunately, unfortunately we've had a lot of experience in, or of course um, the recent um, death of a student where other staff from other buildings come and provide help and support in any way that they can. For the RLC, which again is the professional staff, um, uh, about 25% of their job is focused on paraprofessional staff oversight and development that does include supervision of the grad students in the ARLC position. Again, they work with anywhere from 10 to 25 RAs, uh, and most of them oversee two grad students. So this involves one-on-one -on -one meetings, facilitating staff meetings, um, overseeing their programming, and all the aspects that the RA is involved with to make sure that they're doing their job. Uh, 
it also includes a lot of administrative work um, with a building, an area of anywhere from 600 to 1,750, there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of people and moving parts to track. Uh, of course, there is also crisis management, counseling, and conduct. Uh, that is, I'm sorry, the administration is marked, okay, sorry, my name is no longer up there, 20% uh, um, is uh, basically spent on administration. 20% uh, is also spent on crisis management uh, and counseling and conduct. I would say that in my eight years here, that probably is higher. Um, my staff probably spend more along the lines of 25 to 30% of their day uh, uh, or their week dealing with crisis um, as students. When I first got here, uh, we would occasionally get someone who was having some emotional or psychological needs and we'd send them to counseling and I'd work with counseling and we'd uh, ha have them go for a 72 hour hold and then work to bring them back and help them re-engage into the community. Uh, unfortunately, it's gotten to where it's probably all more of a regular occurrence where every, at least once a month, um, if not every other week, uh, we have someone who's going for that help and assistance. Um, and so, uh, and then of course, crisis, we've had our share of that this year, um, and conduct, and that's everything from quiet hours, uh, people not being quiet, to dealing with very serious situations that involve um, verbal harassment, physical harassment, sexual harassment, um, which uh, are handled through our judicial process, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I talked about programming and student development, uh, as well as, again, other duties as assigned. Yes, Bernadette. Do you have any sense of why there has been a dramatic increase in the amount of time spent on crisis management? Uh, I would say that uh, there are more students coming to campus who are on medication, um, and when they get to campus, decide to stop taking their medication. Um, so I think that's a fair amount of that. I think there's also a lot more pressure on our students today. Uh, students are facing um, really challenging times. Uh, finances are very difficult. A very large number of our students are not only living and going to school in our, and on campus, but they're also working. And sometimes they're working full time. Uh, and also sometimes they're sending money home. So they're paying for their school. They're trying to live in the residence halls, and they're sending money home to support their family. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on our students today, and our world continues to get more complicated, uh, and I think that we don't communicate with each other in the way that used to be before email and the internet. Um, we have students who uh, text their roommate, you wanna go to dinner? They're right next to them, but they can't turn around and talk to them. Communication is a huge issue. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, I wanna move on. Uh, our next topic is RE training. Um, I did do an overview of the RE training. Um, so we do uh, training throughout the year. Uh, we do an intense, we have two intense training programs prior to uh, the academic semester, one in the fall and one in the spring. You will get a handout. I know that you all got um, in section I don't have that marked. Uh, you all have the behind closed doors and the open doors. That is a... It's an exhibit I. It's about five hours of our training. We do 107 hours of training uh, with that. Um, and that does not include eating. So that's actual in-session time. Our training mission that our RA training committee um, has put forth is this. Developing interactive, intentional, and an engaging student staff training program that prepares our paraprofessional staff to promote vibrant residential communities, foster positive interpersonal relationships, and provide a diversified skill set. In that, as I mentioned, in fall, we did 107 hours of training in two weeks. Uh, it covered many of the areas of the RA position and all the things that students needed to know in order to meet our training mission as well as to meet the needs of our residents. I'm gonna just kind of tell you the main areas, and again, you will get this handout. Um, so I will try and go quickly. I've, ex I've used my 30 minutes, apparently, so I have my little time. Uh, but um, 
So uh, the areas are the RA role and the administrative responsibilities, teaching people what it means to be an RA and um, the admin pieces. Um, that's 13% or 14 hours. Uh, the team and leadership development, which is about 12%, 13 hours. Student and community development, uh, again, 13 hours, 12%. Um, diversity and social justice, 11 hours, which is 12% of our program. Uh, I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong one. 11 hours, which is 10% of our program. Student conduct, policies, confrontation, mediation, 20 hours, which is 18.5%. Uh, counseling, sexual assault, and other resources, including the education um, accessibility uh, services. Um, and that is eight hours or 7.5%. Uh, emergency preparedness and response, which is uh, 9.5 hours, 9%. Uh, and then community preparation for everything they need to do to get ready for the students to come, um, that's 18.5 hours or 17%. In the spring semester, we spent 42 hours in four days. Uh, and um, I'll just uh, go over the areas. Again, more RA role and administrative responsibilities, following up. Um, ensuring that we are in, in tune, 25% was spent on that. Uh, team and leadership development, 9%. Student and community development, 10.5%. Diversity and social justice, 13% at 5.5 hours. Student conduct policies, confrontation and mediation, 10.5%. Emergency response, 7%. And again, community preparation, 25%. In addition, we also do monthly uh, training of three hours um, where we focus um, on the needs of what our staff need to, to hear, what areas of training they need to have. Uh, so it can be administrative. Uh, typically, it is administrative, uh, diversity and social justice, uh, as well as um, student and community, community development focused. Who specifically conducts the training? Who do you hire to conduct the training? We don't hire anyone. We do the training ourselves in collaboration with many colleagues um, from around the university, including counseling services, uh, student conduct and ethical development, um, health and wellness. Um, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Uh, hmm? Oh, UPD comes in. Mosaic has come in and done training. Um, and so we use campus partners. Uh, we also have staff that um, present many of the workshops. I do the workshops um, throughout housing. Um, people who have expertise in different areas um, and experience. So you mentioned that um, the monthly three-hour trainings were kind of in response to what the RAs kind of needed on a monthly basis. Um, what was the training about that was immediately following the incident that occurred in the fall? Was there maybe a special training geared towards that specific situation, or how did you guys respond in terms of training? Uh, after the incident, we actually had several meetings and talked with our staff uh, in many different ways outside of that three-hour training. Um, we met with the, the president. We met with uh, the vice president for student affairs, um, the associate vice president for uh, student affairs, um, as well as in building time. Uh, we had a lot of... Um, so we have this thing called, we have uh, training that we do the, for all of the RAs, and then we also have what we call in-hall time, which is where it is the CVC building uh, will have a time for their area, because each building and area is so different. Uh, and so we had a lot of those. Uh, in addition to that, there's also um, staff meetings every week. Um, so the week that we do not have the, the, what we have training once a month, Every other week, we have a, a, a two to three hour staff meeting that we go over agenda items, business items, and if needed, they do additional training as well. So uh, there are many different ways that we infuse training. To speak to what you're asking, <coughs> there were a lot of different conversations that we had. We talked about a lot of different things. We talked about counseling. We talked about um, diversity. We talked about, um, so one of the things I want to be very clear about is that we have talked about diversity a lot. Again, it is, at the, it is at the foundation of what we do with our training, and it is something that we consider as we do all pieces of training, including emergency procedures. Um, one of the things we did do this year is we did um, a bunch of uh, developing dialogues to have conversation, because uh, what we find is, is that a lot of times students um, 
and staff get preached at. And you sit there and then people just talk at you. Um, and I don't believe that that is um, as productive a way to really learn um, and understand diversity and social justice. Uh, and so we do a lot of interactive pieces. Um, and so um, one part was we, we did a program called the Ally Project. It's actually something we try to do on this campus. We've done it several times with different members around the university. Um, and it basically talks about the fact that um, this is based on the LGBT um, ally zone program or the safe zone program, but it takes it to another level. And that is where um, that all students or all people, not just students, all people uh, who are underrepresented group in underrepresented groups need allies. We are not there yet. The work is not done. Uh, and so uh, the big eight that I talked about, all of those areas, those are things that we talk about. You asked about symbols, so I wanna address that. Um, we do talk about symbols and symbology, both the positive and the challenging. What does that mean? We have those conversations. Uh, we talk about um, the assumptions that people make. And when I look at you and I say, okay, these are the things I think about you, right, wrong, and different, um, probably many of them wrong. Uh, that's how I categorize you and then I choose to interact with you. And we challenge people to go beyond that and to look beyond that and to not assume that because you look one way, that's who you are, how you identify, or how you should be treated. Again, one person is not all. And that is one of our main philosophies. We also talk about oppression. And we're very clear about what oppression is and we talk about power and we talk about prejudice. Uh, we talk about conversing with care and how people have those dialogues and that it's not just, it's okay to disagree, but to be brave and to go there and to have those conversations. And when issues and concerns come up, that you encourage people to create a space where they can talk and be real and be honest. Um, it's hard, it's not easy, um, but this is what we talk with our students about and work to train them on. We also talk about privilege and how that affects um, them uh, and other uh, pieces of um, how to be an ally. We talk about identity development. Uh, we talk about, we provide um, information about um, Cross's identity development model, Helms's white identity development model, uh, Cass's sexual orientation identity development model, to name a few. We talk about that overall process and what that looks like, recognizing that our first year students come in at a very different mix of places. Some are gonna come in right here and others are gonna be farther developed and those people are gonna be roommates and what does that look like? Um, and then again, what it means to be an ally. Uh, I tell my staff, our goal is to build inclusive communities and therefore it is important that you are an ally. I do wanna continue on, I know we're short on time. Um, I wanted to talk about, sorry, I'm losing my notes. Uh, the um, conduct piece, very quickly, uh, another uh, document that you'll receive is the community and personal responsibility statement. When students move into the residence halls, they sign um, their room inventory sheet, and also when they sign up for housing, they say that they will read the community living handbook. It has all of our policies in it. It talks about many different things. Actually, many of the documents I'm sharing here with you are in that, i.e., who's who, community responsibility, and it talks about their responsibility. You talked about that last uh, time you met, about the responsibility of the individual and the role that they play in their experience. Um, and so uh, this document here talks about our judicial process as well as um, the responsibility of our students as we continue to create a civic um, environment. The last thing I wanna, um, well there's a couple more quick things. The roommate agreement, you all have a copy of that um, in the exhibits. Um, and uh, so you all have seen that. And then one of the questions was, how did that come about? What does that look like? So as Vic shared, students don't communicate. As I talked about, roommate, people don't talk to their roommate. Um, they don't, can't ask them to go to dinner. Um, so it, for them to engage in dialogue about a roommate situation, um, typically there's a honeymoon <coughs> phase where everything's great, sure, eat my food, wear my clothes, sleep in my bed, whatever you want. Um, and that's not very realistic. Um, and so we created this document um, really to facilitate dialogue for the students. The intention wasn't that we would come in and see if they gave all the right answers, but was to facilitate their conversation in order to be successful in talking about the issues that mostly come up when roommates start to have issues. 
Um, the reason that the RA was there to put on there was to make sure that they did it, for them to talk with them about it, make sure that they had been serious about it, um, and if not, then to make sure that they, they do that, and they follow up to make sure that everybody does this. That's the initial, that was the original intention, to help facilitate conversation where students won't have it. Um, since this incident, and in this circumstance, the RA did ask the question, it does talk about that in the report, um, what does that mean? They said it was an inside joke, so those are the things where when those things come up, they're like, okay, it's about a bike lock. Someone's going to take someone's bike and lock it to a tire or to a tree. Not sure what that means. Um, since then, we've talked with our staff to make sure that there are no questions on those forms, um, and our professional staff are reviewing them. Um, again, not the original intent, but it is something that we have done since this incident. Um, there is also a roommate starter kit. Uh, that is another document you'll get, also in the Community Living Handbook, uh, to talk about how to be a roommate and what that looks like. Again, to give people the tools. Okay. Um, uh, going back to judicial just really quickly, uh, I wanted to talk about Kate. One thing uh, on the agreements, so you're saying these agreements are only utilized when a problem looks like? No. So they're utilized? Every student within the first month of living on campus fills this out. Got it. They're utilized, so like if um, Emily and I are roommates and things start to come up, we would bring this out Got it. and say you talked about this and you're not holding to that. Uh, with the, um, so we have a couple um, groups on campus. One is the Campus Incident Management Team, uh, which is a student affairs group that meets with UPD. They meet weekly, um, someone from housing, uh, student involvement, uh, the um, Education um, Access uh, Center, um, and um, or Accessible uh, Center, Accessibility Center, um, and Student Conduct and Ethical Development to talk about issues, um, to review police reports, to talk about those things that are happening so we can see if things are happening in the different areas. Similar to what Kate does, but it does it on a more of a macro level. Um, Kate meets every two weeks. UPD is the group that meets in both of those uh, groups. Um, and so we work very closely with student conduct and ethical development. When incidents occur, they are documented by the RAs, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and as things come through, as incidents happen, they're notifying staff, they're notifying us, and we're bringing it up as far as it needs to go. In some circumstances, I'm notifying the director, he's notifying Kathy, uh, the AVP. Um, and it, it goes to where it needs to go so that it can get um, heard by the appropriate people. I have one quick question again on the agreement. So it being mandatory of students, has that always been the case, or is that since the incident? No, in my tenure, uh, eight years here. plus, it's been here before I was here. Okay, and how early in the process are students given the agreements to sign? Well, they need to have a couple, like a week or two to kind of figure out what's what. Um, and so it's usually about the second or third week. So it's within that first month that they're supposed to sit down, have that conversation. So like the first two, uh, like the third and fourth week of, the, of their experience there to do that. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the date on the agreement that was involved in the incident was September 23rd. So was that, how, how far Yeah, we was opened that um, August 16th. August 16th. Right, was it 16th? So this was signed on the 23rd. So yeah. clearly some things had happened see, before then, sure. so I was just and wondering that when. that could definitely have happened, but if we do them too soon, then we find they're not useful. Right. They don't have good dialogue because they don't know enough about what it means to live here in that independence piece. Okay, so this was like, what, uh, six, six weeks after? Well, no, because you said it was September. September 23rd. Right, we opened on August 16th. 16th, so, so five it was about weeks. Five weeks, yeah. And they do their best, but again, they're students and trying to catch students. That sure. can be very challenging, especially when there's eight of them. Sure. So uh, okay. to try to get them to all come together. Okay, thank you. Follow-ups, uh, follow-ups real quick, Chris. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. In looking at the appendix, I noticed that there are multiple of the roommate agreements. So is what happens is if there's like a conflict or something, do they then fill out another roommate agreement? Because there no. are some that are dated here, the 13th of September, the 20th of September. So um, the suites are a little bit more complicated. Uh, in the bricks, we have two roommates, two people, that's it. Uh, and um, in the suites, we have eight people living in a suite that share a common area, well, a living room, uh, kitchenette and some bathroom areas uh, and then in they have a bedroom that they share with another person or in some circumstances two other people uh, and so they fill out one for their room with the people that they live there so there's four of those and then they fill out one for the suite so then there's one of those which is why there's five thank you mm -hmm. yes go ahead Diane um, I have a question about the programming 
Um, how do you encourage the residents to come to resident programming? Um, and because it's not mandatory, am I correct? Because when I was no, a resident, people it think it's mandatory, but it's not. Okay. Well, um, my question is, how do you encourage them? Because I know when I was a freshman, my schedule was hectic, and I couldn't make out to many of them. So, how do you encourage residents? Mm -hmm. Well, we really try to address issues that um, meet the needs of residents. We talk with residents, see what they need, see what's going on. Sometimes they don't know what they need, uh, so we provide that for them. Uh, food is a great uh, attractor. Uh, prizes, uh, opportunity drawings. Uh, those, so those for some of our bigger events. Um, we provide a, a range of uh, both social, educational, and academic programs. Uh, we do um, posters. They're really good at that. Uh, flyers, word of mouth. Um, we do sucker invitations. You know, here, have a sucker, and it's got a program uh, information on it. Um, sometimes they do programs in the elevator. So uh, sometimes you got to take the mountain of Muhammad, or whatever that phrase is. So. Follow up to that. Um, Real quick, go ahead. How do we encourage, how do you have diversity training that's kind of mandatory for all residents? Because I think that's where we're getting to the gist of that. I actually have a suggestion. Uh, I think that we need to continue to do the programming that we do. I think we have a strong, uh, one of the questions was about training uh, and what else we could do. I think we have a very strong program. As I said, we spend 107 hours doing training uh, in the fall semester. Uh, we certainly could use more time in order to go more in depth. But the thing is, is there's so many different things that we need to train people to be able to handle. Um, everything from earthquake training to um, counseling issues to um, all the different resources so that we can help people get the need, get to whatever campus resources are out there. Um, so it's, it's definitely challenging. So none of um, the programming is mandatory, is that what I'm hearing? No, programs are not mandatory. None of it is? No, okay. but they're, you know, we go door to door, we not do uh, knocks and so forth. One suggestion that I did have, and I might be a little out of order, but is um, I know that uh, you actually, I believe, spoke about um, leadership today and what an amazing program that is, and I absolutely agree. One suggestion that I would have for the task force um, is to create a first year uh, experience course uh, because um, within orientation and even within housing, there's no way to be able to teach everybody the things that they need to do and ensure that they are there to hear them. Uh, by doing a first year course, as many campuses and universities have done across the country, you can provide information, education, training, literal training to students uh, with on-time delivery of when they need it. Because there is a course of where first-year students go and what they need when, uh, so that they can best be successful in their first year here on campus. Have you finished covering your areas? I got a little off, let me just verify, I think so. so we have, we've, we've got an hour left. Yes, I, I do, and I want to give time for them. Okay, quick follow and up. just one second, I want to see what she's gonna, you gonna finish up, and uh, then I'll take Gary's. I think I've covered most everything. Okay. And you have handouts you're going to give us yes, subsequently? Yes, before I All leave right. here, yes. Gary, you had a question, and then we're going to go to Emily and Richard. Um, I'm sorry, I may have misheard you. Did you say that there were plans for a first-year academic requirement course? No, my suggestion for the task force is that that be a recommendation that you make to the university, is that they have accredited, mandatory first-year course that all first-year students have to take. Um, this is a course that could be taught by faculty and staff as has been done at other universities, in order to be able to provide and infuse things that are so amazing, like leadership today, but be able to do that in a manner that could be affordable, manageable, and workable, and also not have class sizes that are so large. So these would be smaller groups of 20 to 30 at max students. I'd appreciate it if you would, at some point, just put that recommendation as specific as you can and a rationale for it in writing and then email it to me. Sure, I can even send you uh, syllabuses of okay. other universities. Just, but whatever, just yep. if you would do that, I'd appreciate it as soon as you could. We okay. have one hour left. We're going to go to the next people and then we're going to come back to task force members. All right, Emily. Well, thank you all. So for flash orientation, I have 12 questions. So um, I will be brief, but again, I believe that a lot of things are in the report and the addendum, so you can ask clarifying questions. To start, we're gonna start right with what we're doing now. It's a general question about what we would consider training given that what has happened on campus and also um, in our staff training. So first of all, I wanted to start by saying we have hired 30 orientation leaders. They range from first-year students through junior seniors. 
various majors across campus and various makeup of all of the big eight that um, was mentioned previous. What we do with that staff is we actually have a three credit training course, UNVS 199, that is taking place this semester. Students need to get a B in the course to be on staff this summer as an orientation leader. We currently have three returning orientation leaders and then we have a core staff which is seven senior orientation leaders who also work in the office, mentor individual orientation leaders throughout the year and have small groups within that. So what I can share is before this incident happened, well, maybe not before it happened, but before we uh, had known about it, we were in contact with the Southern Poverty Law Center. So we really believe in the speak up material and the speak up material is about everyday bias and speaking up and saying to the people around you that that's not okay. And so we were able to get these free for our leaders and they um, currently are reading them. We actually had a class discussion this week about them and they really like it. So people are using this. These have real everyday examples from real people about instances and how you can say something to stop that bias behavior or comments towards others. So we um, did get that right when this announcement was made. Um, and the other thing that we're looking at, which was brought to me by my assistant director who teaches the course, um, she had found this Choosing Civility book, and it's by PM Forney. She was able to actually get it at cost, a reduced rate, so that we could have that for all of the orientation staff, and they just picked this up this week. Um, we are looking into um, further conversation throughout the semester about this um, tied to everything that we're doing. So the initial discussion started at our retreat in January. We go away for a weekend. We talk a lot about inclusivity, um, trigger words, language, things like that, especially coming in and facilitating with freshmen. We want to be very inclusive in our language and our attitudes. So the next question that I, <clears throat> well, actually, I have one more thing to add to that. We are currently hosting a committee on diversity curriculum at Frosh Orientation, and what that is looking at is being proactive. We were in a place to um, revamp our diversity curriculum and our skits, and so we are doing that right now. Also, after the, the skit portion, which is the highest rated portion of orientation by students, um, we cover a lot of different topics, but we do a debrief in small groups afterwards called Spartan to Spartan. So we're looking at adding some specific debriefing questions, some content, some material about this, uh, about racial diversity. So under recommendations, I would agree with Stephanie. My first thought was people look to orientation uh, because it is mandatory and we, we have a lot of fun um, to do a lot of things. And I don't believe that there is a magical hour of orientation. Um, that could address everything completely. Um, it's about the on-time delivery, it's about follow-up and, and keeping on that and following up continuously on some of the topics that you're addressing. And so I too would recommend a mandatory first-year experience course, which is definitely a best practice across the country. And something that has common curriculum across every college, especially around this topic. The other thing that I can uh, let you all know is that we have spoken with the Southern Poverty Law Center and they have agreed to give us these books this summer for 4,000 freshmen if we can pay a dollar and nine cents per book. So we are trying to figure out if we can make that happen so that we could give this book to freshmen and talk about it and this is the speak up book. Um, so that is something we're currently hoping to do. So those were the general questions that were asked. So specific questions about orientation. The quickest answer is yes, orientation is mandatory. Everyone comes to orientation. If they miss an orientation session, they're not going to be admitted to SJSU. Uh, we track everyone. We take attendance multiple times, including uh, before and after these components where we talk about a lot of these big issues at night. And I do want to just mention that this program is just for Frosh. So transfers, grad students, this is, not, this is not the program for them. So basic information that we cover at Frosh Orientation. It's a, a lot of brain-filling information for the day. 
Um, but students are really coming in wanting to know the basics. They're nervous about meeting anyone. A lot of them come with absolutely no one they know. Uh, about 50% come with one parent or guest. So the basics of what is it going to be like on campus? Is it going to be safe? Where am I going to live? What am I going to eat? Am I going to get parking? Those basic things are really what they're, they're worried about at that time. So we do a lot of work to help them feel comfortable and know their resources. But again, I do believe in following up with the resources throughout the year. So we cover a lot of campus resources. And we're lucky to have a lot of campus partners that want to come out and table and talk to students and host events. And so we invite the rest of campus to um, participate in that process. We have a cross-campus committee where we ask for participation and, and confirm with everyone what they want to do at the sessions. So we also have a folder. And this gets stuffed with material for the students. So we have electronic <coughs> versions, and this is up to individual departments which they want to provide. Um, so some departments just do electronic brochures about their services, and some uh, our staff spend hours and hours all summer stuffing these with information, especially advising information. And so uh, that's one way the students and parents get the information. Something that we started this summer was a mobile app. Uh, we had 4,000 downloads over the summer, and we had the fresh orientation schedule on there. So there's a listing of all of campus resources. There were also five other mobile apps alongside our Ultimate Spartan Guide, and one was for diversity on campus. We cover campus policies. We cover re registration and advising, which is one of the things that students really want and are anxious about. We talk about graduation requirements, the student code of conduct, getting involved, Spartan pride, wellness, and it, under the topic of wellness, mental health, suicide, sexual consent, alcohol poisoning, plagiarism and cheating, roommate conflict, empowered bystander, diversity and inclusion, and finally, we are Sparta. And so under that last category, those are all covered in the University Life 101 skits that happen at night. So it's about a one and a half hour time frame for the skits and then about an hour to 45 minutes for the <coughs> discussion with their small group and their leader. We know that students have better conversations and actually open up more when their peer is leading the discussion and the peer is the one sharing the content. So we definitely train them all year to be able to facilitate these discussions. After the discussion is over, and this was one of the things mentioned in the report, we have a campaign that was started by some of our leaders a few years ago. And it's called We Are Sparta. And we give a card that has values for the university, and we give a pen. And what we're trying to do is say, you've been here with us all day. We want you to be a Spartan. We're proud that you're a Spartan. But here's some of the things that we value in this community. And so the values listed on here are integrity, respect, accountability, achievement, and community. So there's kind of a pinning ceremony, and the students get to put that on their bag, um, on their clothes. Um, and you do see it around during the year. So we, we do that. Um, and it is considered shared values and ethical standards of SJSU. So that's what that is. In terms of a student handbook or a website, like we said, if, if departments give us electronic things, we definitely will throw that up and, and we will have that still up from last year and we'll be updating it soon. Also, we have an, a Spartan Success portal, which has 20 online workshops for various student success areas. In that, we have an event calendar that specifically talks about social justice and diversity events happening on campus. So there was some question about how we tell folks about events. Um, that is a specific area that's listed under the Spartan Success Portal. At orientation, we have a resource fair, which is another way for departments to get their resources out there. We also have special interest sessions, two sets of 30-minute sessions that happen on day one when parents are still here with us. 
and you can choose which ones you go to. Um, we did have one this year on Empowered Bystander. I have a question. Hmm? Ho ho before you ask that, Gary, how much longer do you have? How much more do you have? Um, probably five to ten minutes. Okay, if you could make it five minutes, that would be great. Okay. And Gary, would you just hold off on yours, and then let's have her finish up, and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, so when speaking about the mission of campus and promoting diversity, we do talk about the mission of SJSU. We also talk about the higher mission of higher education and why people are really in college. Um, so that is addressed during the Get Connected small group, which is about an hour after lunch on the first day. It's the first time that they get into their small groups of about 15 students to one orientation leader. So services offered to students interested in learning about diversity Included in the mobile app, but also in their hard packet, we have a listing of recognized student organizations. <coughs> and I've discussed the, the online materials as well as the folder information. So in measuring effectiveness of this program, I have a few copies um, that, that we can give to you if you guys would all like to see. Um, but basically, it's a highly rated program our outcomes are based on CAS standards, and some of them tie to um, this information, so let me pull that up. The other thing to know is when students go to that very first small group, they sign a participation agreement, and this agreement says that I agree to abide by the student code of conduct while I'm here, that I will stay here, and I know I need to be in attendance for the entire thing, um, and then we kind of keep that and collect that, and we did have that for all of the students involved. <coughs> so on a Likert scale of one to five, our University Life 101, which is where we have uh, addressed the issue of diversity and the other wellness issues, was a 4.27 out of five. Spartan to Spartan, which is the follow-up debrief, is a 4.26. So those are some of our highest rated parts of the day. Our overall average satisfaction rating for the program is a 4.38, and this is from students. And then for the orientation staff, they're rated at 4.76 out of five. So real quickly, I will talk about some of the main outcomes for the program. One is after attending day one activities, I have a greater sense of connection to the SJSU campus and that is rated at a 4.12 out of five. I feel more familiar with the SJSU campus and community. That's rated at a 4.15 out of five. I have a better sense of the purpose of higher education and the mission of SJSU, 4.17. During the program, I felt I had the opportunity to have meaningful discussion with my group leader and other frosh, 4.26 out of five. Thank you. All right, is there anything else from the panel right now? If not, I'm gonna start with questions from our task force members. I beg of you, make your questions, fashion them as briefly as you can. Please do not give a speech and just ask a question. And I ask also our panelists to give your responses as briefly as you can so we can get through the next 45 minutes. So we're gonna start, let's see. Uh, Maria, and then Gary, and then Linda, and then Willie, and then Rick, okay? Here we go. Is there a fee for orientation, and if a student cannot pay the fee, is there a waiver? Yes, so the fee is $250. This program is completely funded by the fee, including um, all of the staffing. It's, there is no state funding involved in the program. Um, and we have a partial fee waiver, which is, covers half of the cost, and that's in place right now um, for students who tell us, and also for some parents who tell us that they have trouble coming up with that. That is part of the next steps process and the intent to enroll process. Uh, students need to pay that by May 1st, and that's their financial commitment that they're going to come to SJSU as well. How is the information about the waiver distributed to the students? Right now, this year, it is currently a link on the side of 
the Next Steps website that they log into. Okay, next, Gary. Okay, my question has a couple parts to it. First part is about orientation, freshman orientation. Apologize that I don't have that I don't know this information myself, but I haven't been a freshman for a few years now, fourth year. Probably changed. Right. So you say that orientation pretty much what uh, is there an orientation session that gets African American students acquainted to the resources that African American students are provided? Um, if not, should there be? And the second part of the question is exactly what are these services and who's responsible for providing them? Okay, uh, what I can tell you is that Mosaic hosts and has hosted the welcome reception during fall welcome days, and that actually, uh, usually we help fund that. And in the past, they've had three separate for the for three separate groups. One is Asian Pacific Islander, one is Hispanic Latino, and the other is African American. Um, they have in the past provided very specific handouts to the people who come about local resources um, for each of the populations and things that might be very specific to them. Um, and so we look to them as kind of experts on providing that. And that happens during fall welcome days and not at orientation. Not at orientation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and as far as the exact services, is it, is it only Mosaic that, that can choose to provide certain resources? I mean, for African American students in particular. At this time, it's, it's, mostly, it's Mosaic that I'm aware of. So there are no services for African American students besides Mosaic. It's, it's a question. Not specifically. Uh, most of the, the services that we offer are open to every student. Right. Would um, the director of student involvement like to chime in? And, 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 I'm, and I'm asking this question on the backdrop of a 36% graduation rate for African American students. So, Are you asking specifically, though, during the orientation program over the summertime? No. She already stated that there were no... Um, sessions for African American students. So now I'm asking, what are the services for African American students on campus with the backdrop of 36% graduation rates? On campus, I know that, um, as Emily had said, our partners, whether it be with Mosaic, um, well, actually, you, African American students, it would be Mosaic. Um, that's what I can think of at this point. Okay, let's take oh, another. Oh, NPHC, sorry. Okay. Another question, let's see who was up next. Linda. Uh, I have a, first of all, thank you for all the information. Uh, and obviously your programs are quite extensive. Uh, I've see, been at Morris Daily on the freshman orientation and you see them come in in the morning and they're very excited and energetic. And if you see them at about two, their eyes look glazed over because of how much is going on. So I was wondering what recommendations you may have, and you may not be able to answer that directly right now, but certainly as a task force member, I'd be interested in your recommendations about ways where there can be more systematic orientation around some of these very crucial issues in a way that they can digest it a little bit better, because I really <clears throat> do think it's an overload process for them. It's a necessary process. I, I know there's so much they need to know. But I just wonder uh, if you have any suggestions on how to deal with that. Yes, yeah, so we can say um, 2 o'clock is advising. They've just learned all their graduation requirements, and for 60% of them, the, their remediation has to happen, and they're very worried about it. Yeah. There's a lot of anxiety that comes up at the first um, advising overview, and it is two hours or more. Um, and so we do know a lot of people ask us about our evening portion. And so the parents leave at that point, and that is when we have the University Life 101 skits and we have the Spartan to Spartan discussion. I will say that it is a myth that they're not paying attention. I think if you came and sat in the room, that is the most engaging part of the day. Um, we know that they're tired at the end of the day, um, and we definitely this is why we recommend also following up throughout the first year with various programs. The brain is full. They're anxious about the basic needs, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, and we really want to support that and be able to provide different things throughout the following semester to follow up on a lot of these things because they're, they're, ve they're very worried about classes, and at that point when they get that anxious, it's hard to really take in a lot else. Yeah. Okay, Willie? 
Take, take the mic, questions. please. Take the mic. Stay at the whole thing again. I have about five real quick questions that sort of go through the whole presentation. Turn the mic up, please. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, the first question real quick is that you indicated that there are uh, 3,722 students in housing. What's the total campus enrollment? Uh, it varies and fluctuates. In my eight years here, it has been as low as, I believe, 24, 25,000 and as high as 32,000. What's it now? Uh, 30, 30, 31. Okay. <laughs> okay, because I just wanted to, you know, understand that we're talking about climate in the dormitories, but it's also the rest of the campus. Uh, the second question, I'm just curious. Um, you mentioned that a lot of, there have been an increase in issues uh, with students because, you know, a variety of reasons. I'm just curious, did you find uh, a greater increase in the themed communities versus the non-themed communities? Uh, no, I don't actually think so. As I uh, think back, I, I think that uh, they've been really scattered throughout. Uh, no one specific or more preponderance comes to mind. Okay. And uh, two of you made a recommendation on a uh, first year uh, course mm -hmm. that you think would do a lot of this. And uh, one of you mentioned that it's a, a nationwide best practice. Yes. Have you made this recommendation to the administrators of the campus? Yes. And what was the response? Great idea. Uh, I think where it gets dicey is the implementation and the potential cost of that. Okay, and then just the final question is, um, what's your sense of the campus climate? As, you know, not just in the, uh, the residential housing, but your senior administrators have been here for a long time. What's your general sense of the uh, the campus climate as it relates to racial ethics. Excuse me, before spot? you answer, is that question to everybody? Anyone who wants to answer? Oh, yeah. All right. Ready? Okay. Um, so I've been here for seven years, and, and I can say we see a lot of excitement in orientation, which is my view of things. I get to see excited people and really awesome leaders. Um, I will say that I've seen campus spirit increase dramatically since 2007 when I was here. But I will say um, since this incident and the the housing um, death that has happened recently, the people are sad. People don't really know what to think or where to go, and I think it's a great time to come together as a community versus pointing a finger. And so I'm hopeful that that's what will come out of this task force. Anyone else on the panel want to answer that? I would also add, and I think I understand a little bit more of what Mr. Daniels was asking. Um, part of uh, the responsibilities of student involvement, we work with uh, two specific um, communities within our fraternities and sorority, overall fraternity and sorority community. USFC, United Sorority and Fraternity Council, which are the multicultural fraternities and sororities, and then the NPHC, which is the National Panhellenic Council, or the historically African American um, fraternities and sororities. And between the two of them, there are um, 24 organizations. Um, I've seen in the eight years that I've been here, the um, level of support ebb and flow for uh, those two communities, and uh, we've worked uh, really hard to provide support, support, whether it be inside student involvement or involving um, faculty and staff and other students from around the university. Listening to the concerns coming from both of those uh, sets of organizations, um, we've provided um, suggestions to other departments, whether it be how do we strengthen academic support, how, how do we um, provide, um, whether it be financial resources for programming, uh, connecting those organizations with associated students as an example, um, so that they can do programming for campus, or whether it be our department or others providing uh, similar programming uh, services uh, for those communities. About 30 more seconds so we can move on. Overall, I would say, um, in the eight years that I've been here, um, I feel like um, from my view that things have improved, but there's always room for, for improvement, um, always room for improvement. And um, this year has been particularly hard. I agree with Emily. Um, many of the communities that we work with, um, there has been an overall sense of um, uh, um, sadness that uh, we need to provide uh, support for those, uh, our specific communities on campus. Okay, thank you. Okay, Rick. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Can I get the microphone? Um, I have a, a series of about four different questions. Some of them should be fairly short. Uh, the first one is for Ms. Bauer and Mr. Kelly. Um, is, does the student code of conduct include that it's a violation of the code to racially or sexually harass others in the campus community? 
I would have to specifically look at the code of conduct because um, we're not responsible for enforcement, day-to-day -day enforcement of the student code. Um, if you don't know, it's fine. Let's move yeah. on to the next question. Yes, it does. Unless you do, if you. Yes, it, it specifically talks okay. about harassment, racial, sexual, uh, and physical. Okay. Thank you, that's all I needed. Uh, second question, I believe, is for um, Mr. Collada and Mrs. H Ms. Hubbard here, is uh, does the training include, you, you talked about the training and the, the race-related training, it sounded to me more like uh, leadership training. So does the training include training on identifying <coughs> traditional hate symbols and what they may mean for other residents in the community. For example, if you see a flag with a swastika, et cetera, or if you see white, uh, black uh, uh, Doc Martin boots with white shoelaces. Uh, we don't go into the specifics of every single symbol because there's so many. We do talk about symbols. We talk about that impact. Uh, also, in addition to the ally training, we talk about language. We talk about identity. We talk about creating cl inclusive communities, microaggressions. Uh, and discrimination. Okay. Um, how are the theme communities determined? Uh, they're based on student input and feedback. If we have students who want to create communities, we'll look to do that. Also, we work with campus partners such as business and engineering to create co uh, theme communities. Okay. And then the final question here, it was just, um, I was kind of uh, going off of a question that Mrs. Codrell had here, but it was, was the RA who spoke to us, was he counseled for speaking to us? Absolutely not. Okay. No. So we have others on this side, but I'm going to jump in and just throw in a couple of quick questions, if you all know the answers to it. How many um, RAs are there? There are 64. And how many of those RAs are Latino and African American? I don't have the breakdown. They don't provide us with that information. It's not something we uh, gather um, as uh, we would not have that for our professional staff either, because that is maintained through HR. How many assistant RLCs is there? Nine. And how many of them are, are Latino or African American? Same, uh, same response? They, again, we do not provide, okay. they don't give us that information. We don't hire based on race. However, I will say that our staff um, are a wide mixture of diversity uh, and very diverse. I'm sorry, your last part you're saying? My staff, the staff is uh, diverse racially, uh, gender, um, okay. sexual orientation, but we, we, we can't do have a cover. I don't have counts no because they don't give that to us. We don't collect okay. that. Um, and is that not public information? You just again, when you're hiring practices, mm -hmm. uh, it's not something okay. that we do. All right. No. Um, of the three thousand or so students, almost four thousand, who live on campus, do we know how many of them are African American or Latino? Uh, students have the opportunity to provide their ethnicity. Most students give us the ethnicity of NA, which means they decline to answer. Uh, I don't have uh, statistics uh, okay. because, again, many of them don't provide that information. Okay. All right. So do you know how many don't provide that information? <coughs> However, I do have some information um, regarding <coughs> Um, race um, and ethnicity here and um, for our um, university housing services um, of our population um, are you interested in a particular group? I want to know African Americans and Latinos. Yes. Okay. Um, our percentage of Latino, Hispanic Latino um, as self-identified mm -hmm. is 19 percent and African American black identity, self identified, is 9%. 9, and nine. That's, that's of those 3,722 <laughs> residents who live in on campus university housing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're over here on this side, and who, right here, it was uh, Michael, and then, no, first it was Peter, Peter. Can and I then Michael. Vic, is that of the students? Of all students, or is that of students who report ethnicity? Because there was a comment that there was very... Of all students who report their ethnicity. So it's actually, we don't know what the actual number is then. No, but 9% of those who do. Who do. Right. 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 Okay. Peter. So I have a quick question about the themed communities and housing. Um, so you mentioned, uh, Ms. Hubbard, that if a student felt the need for a community or they, a, gr a campus group wanted to form a community, um, what's that process like and who approves it? 
Uh, they would come and meet with us. It is um, somewhat of a lengthy process because our students start signing up. All of our theme communities are in first year communities um, and students start signing up on October 1st. Uh, and so people need to come and talk with us and be able to get that in the work. So typically it's a year in the making um, in order to bring that for, to forward so that we can have everybody have the opportunity to be a part of that. We also wanna talk about what the principles are, what the mission, the goals, uh, and also do some assessment of interest um, because uh, we wanna make sure that uh, it's one that we'll have people sign up for. Uh, when we have a theme community, we have people who are interested in that theme community, um, but there are oftentimes are spaces still left, and so those are filled with other people, but we treat the entire community as a theme community regardless of whether you signed up or not, and they have the opportunity to attend those programs. Okay, quick, now we're at Michael. Quick clarification on what you sure, said. clarification, and then Michael. Very quick question. You, did I understand uh, that the theme communities are first year only? Yes, uh, the one exception is that we have a, well, we have a transfer community uh, <coughs> a, and a co-ed community uh, where you can have intermixed co-ed <clears throat> um, housing uh, by room in apartments uh, in our CVB apartments building. And uh, then we, yeah, those are really the only other communities. Okay. Michael. Yeah, I kind of want to try to understand this again. Uh, and this, this might be redundant, but again, if, if students want to form a theme community, because I'm, I'm kind of having a, a hard time believing with all the themes you've named, but as long as I've been here and heard the chatter, that African-American students have an approach with a theme. So I kind of yeah. have a hard time with we that Can we turn one. this mic up a little bit? I'm having oh, so I, I kind of have a hard time with that one. So I'd like to go through that process one more time. Uh, if students want to have a theme community, what do they need to do again? They need to come and talk with us, have dialogue. I can tell you that when I was here in the late 80s, early 90s as a student, uh, I lived in Mulder Hall, which is where CVA currently stands, and we did have... Um, a diversity community. It was not focused on one particular ethnicity, um, but it was for people who wanted to have a multicultural experience. Uh, and so we've had that in the past. Uh, we've had a social justice community. In fact, the Global Village is a social justice focus uh, as well as um, looking at the world as, a, as an entire village. So we do have pieces of it, but no, we have not had people in my time here come and say they want that. I know that recently after this incident, there was some conversation. We are continuing to have dialogue about that. Okay, so to make a long story short, I'm a student, I wanna have a theme community. I walk up to you and I go, hey, I wanna have a theme community. And then you say. Well, we need to talk about, is it just you? And what does it look like? Um, is it um, connected with different departments? What will that program look like? Is it just for African-American students? Um, all those different pieces. That mm -hmm. We just need to talk about what it would look like and what that experience would be. Okay. And if we feel like it's a good program that we would have um, people sign up for and how we have uh, interest and we have people who are willing to be mentors in different pieces, then that's something we can definitely look to see if we can move forward with. Now, if it's only for first year, and I'm, a, I'm gone by the time it sounds like this happens. No. If, if I understand, that's where I'm kind of. No, so basically, like I said, we need to have it set. So if people want to come now, we would be talking not for the fall, but for the following year okay. um, because of the way the process works. Um, however, we mentors are very important. So the people that are willing to come back, um, we have, we've get done connections like with the social justice group. We work with um, the Cesar Chavez Action Center. We, mm -hmm. They work on Legacy Week. Um, and so we connect with departments. Um, we have uh, the business department work with the Build the Leadership Program. Uh, in CVC, Engineering with Cell, which is our Center for Engineering, um, Living and Learning, uh, or Community, rather. Uh, and so what are those connections that are going to support and provide those services? Because I don't want to create a community that then has no support. I don't want it to be a theme community in name only. What does that mean? What does it look like? Okay, I'm gonna cut it, and we now have the following, Gabriella, then Peter, then Gary, and then Maria. Okay, I want to clarify, for the programs that RAs have to put on, um, is that based on the big eight or, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's based on the criteria. Again, you will get one of these. Okay. And in here it talks about the different, the six different areas um, that we educate on, uh, including multicultural competence, val va values and identity, et cetera. Of um, those six, how many are mandatory for an RA to put They on? have to cover all of them over the course of the year. Um, okay. There is a, a number of programs that they need to do anywhere, well, what they're required to do um, is uh, 
a minimum of eight plus also community development and other things, but most of them exceed those numbers by uh, half or again, double them. Okay, uh, lastly, is there a place where a resident could submit anonymously a concern to housing? Absolutely, they can go to the front desk, they can send an email to the info, they can just come by and do a green sheet, they can talk to their RLC, they can talk to their RA, uh, whether it be in person, anonymous. We obviously want people to tell us who they are so we can do something to help them resolve that situation, but if it's just a comment, they can just drop it off at the desk, they can drop it off um, at the front desk of their building, those things are passed on. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to ask everybody just one question. So now we have the following, we have Peter, then Gary, Maria, Marcos, and then Chris. Okay, Peter. So I have just one final question about the theme communities, I apologize. Um, so given that it sounds like the, major the majority of students that are experiencing the theme community, I, you did mention there were other in CVB, but given that the majority seem to be first years and they don't have much engagement in the formation of these theme communities, um, how do you, is there a process where students can assess or provide feedback for how those themes work, given that they didn't really have much engagement in forming those? Uh, we actually do uh, surveys with uh, the students each year to assess how that theme community is working, what they're getting out of that experience, and what else they might want to get out of it. Uh, and then we continue to uh, adjust the theme community based on that feedback. Okay, Gary? My question is also in relation to the theme community. So from what it sounds like, it's, it's a somewhat straightforward process to actually implementing theme community someone wants them. My question is, say students wanted to create an African American theme community or a Latino theme community or an Asian American Pacific Islander theme community, do you imagine that housing would be hesitant or would give pushback to such an idea if even if students requested that? Again, as I stated before, it would need to be that we would be able to have the support services to be able to have that be a successful, um, meaningful, purposeful experience. If that were the case, we're more than happy to have that dialogue and to talk about it. I don't have a set agenda of what can or cannot. It's just what's gonna benefit our residents. But do you think there will be pushback? No. I think we would be open to it as long as it can be a strong program. That's let good let to me know. just suggest there are legal ramifications that their <clears throat> arguments can be made that uh, San Jose State could receive no federal money if monies were going just to a particular racial group. I mean, those are, there are cases that say that. So while you might be very receptive, the university's legal team may say uh, no. So just, just know there are legal ramifications to doing these kinds of things based on race. Um, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad, I'm just saying it is. And that's the state of the law right now is not, it's such that. This could be ripe for some litigation. Well, I just want to be clear. It's just, just an observation. I just want to be clear that we would not limit that to be only people of that race or uh, identity. Right. So I just want to right. put that out So there. in other words, exactly. So if others were excluded. If that were the and if topic only, of interest, that's right. what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that's the difference. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Next up, uh, Maria. My question is for Stephanie and Victor, and it's uh, specific to the diversity training and programming. And I think, Stephanie, you said that one of the <coughs> categories of training is race and ethnicity, and I wanted to know what are the specific topics within that category? It's a big topic. Uh, we talk about a lot of different things. Um, again, we talked about that we had developing dialogues. Uh, we talk about um, uh, identity and forming action and what that means, basically what you see, how you act, why you react, the way you react, um, and so that people can understand their own self-reaction and how other, other students might react and why they would be acting in that way, again, based on a perceived identity um, and what the messages and tapes are that they have. We talk about language. Language is huge. Our students, um, obviously, well, one of the reasons why we're here today is because of inappropriate use of language um, and how people throw words around. Uh, we've talked about microaggressions um, because of uh, that it's the small things that people aren't necessarily paying attention to. It's not always the big things. Okay, next up, Marcos. Um, so in reading the exhibits, it seems there's um, some very uh, helpful language that, uh, that, that is in terms of responsibilities. So um, I'm here, I'm seeing that like upper level, like the RLCs, I guess, have the RAs report to them on how they're getting to know the students, working collaboratively with residents to develop <coughs> communities that they feel they belong in, um, creating environments that display respect for the rights of others, and responding to inappropriate behavior. So that all seems really, really helpful and important. 
The question that I have and the concern that I have is that it seems like the LRCs are the people who are the key component to this because they are full-time staff employees and they have this kind of professional responsibility to take care of these communities. Um, and they have, uh, you know, between, you said, 10 to 25 RAs reporting to them and then between uh, 600 to 1,700 students that those RAs are supervising. And so what I'm wondering is, is that tenable? Is that manageable? Can those RLCs monitor what's happening for all those students? And, and is there a budget issue that leads to that <coughs> number, um, that ratio? Because it seems to me it's, it's a little tricky and, and might, maybe part of the reason why this happened for as long as it did. Um, I do want to just clarify the um, 25 number staff that I gave you is supervised by two people, two full-time staff. So it's more of a 12.5. So our number ratio is uh, 10 to 14 uh, for the, the mix. It's an average of 13 RLC to RA ratio. Um, and then therefore for the building size, uh, it is um, 1750, again, managed by two professional staff. And that is our upper division buildings, our apartments, um, who are sophomore and older students. Um, and so our other communities are smaller um, and have more staff to address that. Um, in our uh, apartment building, our student to staff, uh, our RA to student ratio is about one to sixty, uh, so it's a little okay. a little bigger. So his question. So though, the question is, do you do you feel like the model works? Do you feel like there's enough um, supervision from the RLCs to the RAs and being able to monitor all the things that are happening on all the floors and having a good sense of what those communities are like, how they're getting to know, how they're respecting the rights, the things that are in the manual. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I think that, um, could we use more staff? Of course. Um, and I think, though, there is a, a national average that we look at. Um, I think, though, uh, we do have a world that gets more and more intense and, and challenging. Um, and so I think one of the things we've been talking about are, are there other ways that we can continue to support students reaching out to the number of counseling issues that we have? What does that look like? How can we partner with counseling services to maybe provide some additional, additional services? Um, also, uh, the reason um, we have grad staff is to help do some of that management piece so that the RLCs can focus more on those pieces. Um, as well. So we used to have, um, prior to Campus Village opening, we had a, a 1 to 200 ratio uh, where the staff had five RAs, um, and that was what that, that uh, supervision size was. Um, that used to be the standard for the nation. Um, that is no longer really the case. Uh, it's very rare that it be that low. Um, I, I think have, it's great. I have six people who want to okay, ask. Sorry. We have 16 minutes, so I'm going to really move it. And Chris. Yes. Okay. Chris. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> my question, it kind of follows a little bit from Marcos. So you mentioned earlier that there's been a lot of incidents uh, in housing, you know, with, with a variety of the things that you mentioned, including, you know, people having uh, some difficulties, and we know that there was a death uh, recently. Um, and so my question has to do with how decisions are made about when something needs to be reported to the next highest level. And so part of the reason I wanted to ask that question is looking in the fact-finding <coughs> report, I noticed that, you know, the, the first report of the, the term bike lock of shame happened in September, and then it's reported that the chief of staff uh, was uh, informed on the 20th of November. And so I'm just a little, I, I just want to know at what, you know, what are some of the criteria, or what point is it that it's decided that an RA, or RLC, excuse me, has to report something to the next highest level, to the next highest level, okay, and then at what the point is it, is it, does it get to the level of the president's cabinet? All right. Uh, well, what I can tell you, okay, uh, um, uh, so the RAs have uh, a high responsibility to send stuff up. We tell them we never want it to sit with them. It's not their responsibility. That's not what they're trained for. Uh, they are a referral agent, um, and the, so they will refer it either to the ARLC, the RLC. That person very often refers it up to the, the associate or assistant director, um, and if it's something that I think is um, uh, something that is more of a, of a moment, I will call Vic and let him know. Sometimes that happens within an hour, all of that. Um, Vic then would pass that information on to the Associate Vice President for Student Affairs. At that point, it's out of our hands. Um, Thank you. Trying to keep that short. Thank you. Gabrielle. Oh, okay. So I was wondering, is this on? Turn the mic up, please. Yeah. I was wondering if I could make a comment about the first year experience or if I should ask a question to the panelists. 
I'm sorry. Gabriel, you wanna, do you have a question or was it a? It's a comment about the first year experience. Okay, I, I want you to hold off on that because I okay. want to get everybody other okay, questions. Okay, then, then I have a question. All right, go right ahead. So, um, so we talk about orientation and how it's kind of effective some, most of, mostly, but I was wondering if, um, what if we extended it to three days instead of two days? Would there be like a cost, a cost to it and like how would that work? <laughs> and also maybe extending transfer orientation since it's only one day currently. So maybe that's something that we could all talk about too as a recommendation. Yes, so I will say registration is open for summer 2014, and those dates are being booked and not really an option to change until next summer. Um, I will say that the current fee, knowing that there is no state support money for this program, including salary, um, that it would go up substantially in cost. And personally, I'm in a place with 250, knowing our students that I don't want to ask for anymore. So we are looking at options for next year about utilizing day two more. Um, that would be more money for providing lunch on that second day, but we are looking at that right now. Um, transfer orientation is through Academic Advising and Retention Services, so definitely something to follow up with them on, um, and that because their program is, is about half a day to one day, depending on how long um, you're here on campus. <coughs> Did that answer your question? Thank you. Rick? Uh, two very quick questions. Uh, the training model on diversity and hate symbols, can you provide it so we can review its contents? Um, it was, uh, what I have written, it was a presentation that was done verbally um, with uh, some slideshows. I don't have um, the specifics. I can look to see what I have. Okay, thank you. A second question is, does the diversity community exist? And if not, what year was it removed? You're speaking to the multicultural community that I referred to earlier. Yeah, uh, I left in 1992. Um, I am not sure. I was gone from the university for 14 years, uh, and I'm not sure when it went away. Um, I'm not sure if it was here until it was removed, uh, i.e. knocked down uh, in order to build Campus Village. Um, it's something that we would definitely be very open to, uh, again, as long as we can have a solid program behind it. Delorme? Yes, uh, could you describe for me what principles ap are applied in your mediation training for your staff? Uh, sure, uh, we talk about um, the ability for people to use I statements to be able to listen to the other person. People a lot of times don't do that. Uh, so really hearing what that person is saying, letting them uh, speak without being interrupted, uh, putting out what they need in order to have happen, in order to move through whatever the conflict is, um, and then hearing the other person to do that, and then working to come to uh, a, a mutual ground so that they can decide whether or not they can live together um, and resolve through this. Uh, we also teach them um, about confrontation, different <coughs> strategies. Um, sometimes uh, they use that in their con uh, when they confront uh, conduct situations, but sometimes they need to use that when they do their mediation as well, depending on um, how uh, intense that mediation is. Okay, second uh, part of that question. Very quickly, yes. and then Michael, and then we have Do to Do you it think up. that the students uh, in the residence hall take real advantage of this when they are in conflict of the mediation? We do program? a lot of mediation okay. with students. Okay, Michael? Yes. Okay. Use the microphone, please. Uh, can you uh, tell us what you think the impact would be of not having all freshmen dorm, but introducing some upperclassmen into the mix? In hindsight, in foresight, um, I've I've uh, I've lived in seven different states and I've been in very different situations. When I was here as a student, uh, the residence halls were completely mixed, and I think there was definitely some benefit to that. But it was a 200-person building where you got to know everyone. Um, I think that what we've learned is that our students, where they want to live and where they don't want to live and where they choose to live and where they don't choose to live, has been an issue, um, and therefore they won't necessarily come back. I've also been in places that they have first and second years. I do not recommend that. Sophomores are not great role models. Uh, the average resident sophomore is not a great role model for our, our students, our first year students. Um, I think that first year students um, are going through a very different experience and being there and being able to experience that with other first year students who are on that same path, um, I think has been very um, positive. And as I've been through different first year experience programs, it allows you to really focus the programming to really meet that specific need and not feel like you have to address so many other different topics that then you water down what our first year students need. So I think there's benefit okay. to it. All right. I have a, just a couple of quick questions. Does the university keep statistics on uh, 
misconduct that relates to hate crimes, bullying? Like uh, we follow all Title IX requirements. Um, our Student Conduct and Ethical Development Office is the one that maintains all of our incident reports go to that office, right. and they do all of the statistics for and the university. And do you find that there's any particular, like freshmen uh, tend to have more incidents of misconduct than, say, sophomores, juniors, seniors? Do you have any sense about that? <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I don't think that they necessarily do. I think the types of things that our first year students, alcohol, uh, are dealing with um, are different because our, our upper division students aren't necessarily um, having as much problems, but we still are having issues. Um. Okay, it's fine. Let us all thank these folks for spending two hours with us and preparing. Uh, I also commend you for your preparation on this. It is greatly appreciated. It was a great suggestion from our task force to have questions submitted ahead of time, and I thank you all for that. But thank you so much. I mean, it's quite clear you spent time putting all this together, and I thank you very much. We may have follow-up for you, in which case we can, we'll send, we can send emails through Dorothy Poole. Uh, I understand you have handouts. We want to make sure we get those handouts, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to turn to our task force members. Uh, we have three meetings left, and uh, we have to come up with recommendations um, that uh, we will send to the administration, and we're going to have that done by our third meeting. Uh, so we uh, need to spend some time uh, talking now about recommendations. Uh, I will tell you that it's my sense that the areas we're, we are looking at now um, our residential living, residential life. Uh, we're looking at orientation and we're looking at campus climate, which is a much more, it's a bigger, you know, the macro and we have the, the micro. Uh, and I want us to start thinking about recommendations based on the information we have in the fact-finding report, in the appendix, in the exhibits, in the handouts, and from the information we've gotten from Professor Murray, from uh, uh, members of the public who have spoken, students, staff, faculty, and also from these individuals here from housing and uh, frosh orientation. So, um, thoughts about the next meeting. Should it be a meeting in which we now actively start discussing recommendations? And if so, that means you all have to start putting them down and then getting them out. And we need to talk about a process. So we don't meet for another two weeks. Is it uh, feasible? Is it practical for you all to, whatever recommendations now you might be thinking about, to put them in writing, get them emailed to me and to Dorothy so we can start kind of putting them in these categories and then our next meeting, we start fleshing these out. What do you think? Well, Michael. Well, a big part of the frustration uh, around this incident seems to be the, the, the speed which which this was reported or the lack thereof. And I think we'd be negligent if we didn't investigate that or talk about that in some way, shape, or form. I mean, it's, it's one thing to talk about housing and what, what did or didn't occur, but there's another piece of this that is very significant, which is the reaction time. But, you know? but let me ask, that's in our, the fact finder said, yeah, there, there were gaps, things did not happen. So based upon that information, that what didn't happen, do we have recommendations based on the information we have here? Well, mostly that was in the report too. I'm sorry? I mean, most of this was in the report, too. So, you right. know. You know um, so, but the question is, I'm not sure what you're saying. We're not fact finders. We have what we have. Uh, we need to move now. We need to, to start making some recommendations. And I don't think we're going to get any more information. I mean, the people involved in this are not going to talk, and they shouldn't. Because things are still, you know, being investigated. Chris, I'll get back to you, Mike. Okay. Chris, and then Markles. Uh, yes, and I, I kind of want to piggyback on Michael. I actually do think that it's it's good for us to start working on recommendations, but I, I definitely agree with what Michael said, and that was kind of a little piece of what I was trying to get out with the question, and it's not in an accusatory way or anything like that, but I just think that one of the things that we could work on recommending before this whole process is over is if we have a little bit more information about the process by which that communication happens, and if there are some things where we see that there can be improvement made in how the, the flow of communication occurs on campus from office to office, from people from positions to position, that it would be helpful for us to be able to include those types of recommendations in the final report. So I absolutely think in the next meeting we should start working on that, but I think that we, I, I don't think that we're at the stage where we are 
wrapped up with everything and then we can just work on recommendations only without still going through a little bit more inquiry. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I, in my view, based upon the answers I heard today about an answer to your question, I already know what recommendations I would like to make because the answer I got was, was not a very concrete one. I mean, it was what the process is. Right. But if we want to have a more defined one, that could be a recommendation. So I, I think we've got all we're going to get. Now we have to kind of think about what we want to do. I'll go to Marcos and I'll go to Anthony. So um, I'm wondering if maybe through email we could identify if there's any information people feel like they still need just so that we have that out there and so that we're clear. And maybe some of that information is already available to us and, and people can be clear about it because we just got hundreds and hundreds of pages. So that's one piece. I think the second thing people could identify is what are the issues that they see are the most glaring. Um, to me, that, that's helpful to lead me towards recommendations. So it might be something that we start out with talking about. Okay, uh, I, I'm I'm going to push back on that because okay. I think we I think we know what we need to talk about here. What recommendations are? I think we are getting at least in that direction. I'll go to Tony, uh, Anthony, then I'll go to Linda. I was going to say thank you. Uh, I do believe we have all the information we need, and we've we've received the reports. We have the investigation. What was lacking in both of those were recommendations, and it's our job now to take that, synthesize it and start to move forward with recommendations. I think that we can, we've got the information. There are gaps, but the gaps should lead to recommendations for us. Uh, you know, and again, we've got three weeks. We can, we've got uh, a couple or three meetings, and we've got two meetings before the final draft to be able to hash that out in the form of recommendations because, again, there aren't too many more things we need to know about. I think now it's about flushing them out and synthesizing where we go with it. Okay, Linda? Uh, I, I agree that I think we certainly need to be moving uh, toward recommendations. My biggest concern is that, uh, and some of us on campus have had discussions about this, after the diversity master plan was developed, I think in whatever year that was, there were some things the campus have, has put in place to try to deal with some of the campus climate issues what I would be very concerned about is if our committee made recommendations that in fact some, some of those things are already in place. So, and I'm not quite sure how to get to that, uh, but that would be one of my concerns. I, I, sure. I, I, I think some of them, that's not an issue. I yeah. think, so but, one way okay. to do that is initially make all those recommendations and then we can have staff, you know, they'll be looking at these and say, okay, well, we, there's this, this, and this getting back to us. So okay. I think that right. that we could do that, so that without will be sure. Part of, the process. sure. That's what, that's of course, what I mean this is all going to be done all out in the open, transparent. So we want to get that feedback. Anything else? So we're going to our next meeting. Is Thursday, March twentieth, same place, same time, and we will be discussing recommendations. I believe again we're looking at issues that came up in residential life orientation, campus climate. That's what we're looking at. Okay. Um, and yes, Diana. Um, I just have a quick question. Are you going to forward the email from Stephanie about the, um, the transcript or the um, green sheet of the class, of the first year class? That they recommended. She mm -hmm. recommended, green sure. sheet is a syllabus. Anything that yeah. you want us to have. So you'll just send it to Dorothy, she'll send it to or Dorothy Mann, and we'll send it out. Of course. Okay. okay. Thank you. Absolutely. And we'll get it done very quickly. So this meeting is adjourned. We'll see you March 20th. You will, well, I'll send you an email, but basically I'd like to get your recommendations. If you can get them to us, we want them in advance of the meeting, and I'll get you an email out about when we need them. Probably about maybe three days before the meeting for it, and then we'll put them all together and we'll start talking. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.